Hi guys, welcome to Chapter 8 Lecture Outline. This is the formation of the solar system in Chapter 8. Here we go. Here's a diagram of what we think the solar nebula looked like four and a half billion years ago. A rotating gas disk with dust and gas and other elements inside of it. Our goals for learning will be how did we arrive at the theory of solar system formation and where did the solar system come from? So there are four major features needed to be explained. Okay, so there are four major features that need to be explained and several responsible Reasonable hypotheses were explored, the nebula hypothesis and the close encounter hypothesis. What are these properties that a solar system must formation a uh, theory explain? Well, we have patterns of motion of the large bodies. They orbit in the same direction and the plane. The existence of two types of planets, terrestrial and Jovian, the rocky ones like Earth and the gaseous ones like Jupiter. The existence of smaller bodies such as asteroids, comets, and meteors. And then the notable exceptions to usual patterns such as the rotation of Uranus on its side and the Earth's moon. So the solar nebula theory comes from the state that our solar system formed from the gravitational collapse of a giant interstellar gas cloud, the solar nebula. And nebula is a Latin word for cloud. Two scientists named Kant and Laplace proposed the solar nebula hypothesis over two centuries ago, and a large amount of evidence now supports this idea. The close encounter hypothesis is not as well accepted, but it says that a rival idea proposed that the planets formed from debris torn off by the sun in a close encounter with another star. That hypothesis could not explain the observed motions and the types of planets we have. So we have thrown this hypothesis, the close encounter one, out of the loop. So the question becomes, where did the solar system come from? Well, we know that elements forming by the planets were made in stars and then recycled through interstellar space through supernova explosions. We can see that stars forming in other interstellar gas clouds like the Orion Nebula. They lend the support to the solar nebula theory. So we know that the hypotheses arose to explain four major features in the solar system. Testing and the observation leads from hypothesis to theory. And we know that the solar nebula theory states that the solar system formed from a large interstellar gas cloud and that the galactic recycling built the elements from which the planets formed from supernova explosions. So the next section will look at explaining the major features of the solar system. Let's get to the part that's good here. So the solar nebula was a big blob of gas and dust. It started to spin and it flattened out into a disk. Collisions between gas particles and the cloud gradually reduced random motions. The spinning cloud also flattens out as it shrinks. Now we have seen this around other stars. <clears throat> we have seen that observations of disks around other stars support the nebula hypothesis. And so now we know that there are two types of planets in our solar system, the terrestrial and the Jovian. The terrestrial being Mercury, Mars, Venus, and Earth, and the Jovians being Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the gas giants. So we know that the terrestrial planets formed from small particles of rock and metal that were present inside the frost line. That's the place where ice freezes in the solar system. These tiny planetesimals of rock and metal built up as these particles collided with each other and accreted. 
The gravity eventually assembled these planetesimals into terrestrial planets. So these, so these tiny solid particles stick together to form planetesimals, baby planets we call them. The gravity draws the planetesimals together to form planets and the process of assembly is called accretion which we have discussed. So many small objects collected into just a few large ones. Well in contrast, how did the Jovian planets form, the gas giants? These are more ice-like. The ice could also form from small particles outside the frost line, too far away from the sun to melt. The large planetesimals and planets were able to form, and the gravity of these larger planets was able to draw in the surrounding hydrogen and helium gases. And these are the primordial gases that formed the solar system and the universe, hydrogen and helium. So how did the Jovian planets form? The gravity of rock and ice and the Jovian planets drew in the hydrogen and helium gases that were outside the solar system. The moons of the Jovian planets, which there are many are of, formed in miniature disks, their own little solar system. So a combination of photons and the solar wind, the outflowing matter from the sun, blew away the leftover gases around these Jovian planets. We know in the solar nebula theory that the young sun four and a half billion years ago rotated much faster than it does now. And the friction between the solar magnetic field and solar nebula theory possibly slowed the rotation over time. Well then we have other stuff in the solar system, the leftover junk the asteroids and comets, where did they come from? Leftovers from the accretion process. Rocky asteroids were inside the frost line and the icy comets were outside the frost line. So the asteroids tend to be between Mars and Jupiter. Jupiter being close to the frost line and the comets mainly being outside of Neptune's orbit. Now in the process of heavy bombardment, the leftover planetesimals bombarded other objects in the late stages of the solar system formation. How did the Earth get its water? Water may have come to Earth. Oh, go back here. The water may have come to Earth by way of icy planetesimals, comets striking the Earth to bring their massive amounts of water and ice. Of course, there are always exceptions to the rule. We know Uranus is tilted sideways, 97 degrees to its tilt. Why is this the case? We know that some planets have captured asteroids and have made them into moons. And these are the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, Fear. Unusual moons of some planets may be captured planetesimals, and these are not very big. They're 6 and 12 miles across as compared to our moon, which is a lot, a lot bigger. Okay, so how do we explain the existence of our moon, which we call Luna? At one point in time, there were four hypotheses that tried to explain the formation of the moon. And the one that seems to fit all the computer models and all the observations and the hypotheses that fit it is a giant impact. We suspect a object the size of Mars, one third the size of Earth, hit the Earth at one point and made a glancing blow. Not a direct hit, but a glancing blow and blew off material into space, which then recoiled us to form the moon. We think that some giant impacts may have explained the different rotation axes of some planets like Uranus. Perhaps a massive comet hit Uranus in its early stages and knocked it on its side. So was our solar system destined to be? The formation of the planets in the solar system nebula seemed inevitable and we have seen this now thousands of times in nearby stars. But the details of individual planets could not have been different. So we know that the solar nebula spun faster at one point as it contracted because of the conservation of angular momentum, kind of like a spinning speed skater or a figure skater. The collisions between gas particles then caused the nebula to flatten into a disk. 
And now the question is, why are there two major types of planets? It's the frost line. Only rock and metals condensed inside the frost line. The rocks, metals, and ice is condensed outside the frost line, which is between the lines of Mars and Jupiter. Larger planet Tasmos outside the frost line drew in the, what was left over in the hydrogen and helium gas to become the gas giants. We know that there are leftover stuff, comets and asteroids, according to the solar nebula theory. And we explain these exceptions to the rules because of bombardment of newly formed planets by planetesimals and or asteroids and comets that may explain the exceptions. So now let's take a look at how old the universe is. How do we measure the age of a rock? And how do we know the age of the solar system? We believe it to be 4.6 billion years old. How do we know this? We can look at half-lives of radioactive elements that tell us how long something's been around and how long it's, how old it is. And this is called radioactive decay. Isotopes, which are flavors, if you call it, of different atoms, decay into other nuclei. And a half-life is the time for half the nuclei of a substance to decay. So our radiometric dating tells us that the oldest moon rocks are about 4.4 billion years old. The oldest meteorites are about a little bit older, 4.55 billion years old, and that the, the planets themselves probably formed about 4.5, 4.6 billion years ago. So we know that some isotopes of certain elements decay with a very well-known half-life. Comparing the proportions of these isotopes with the decay products tells us the age of the rock. And the radiometric dating indicates to us that the planets formed about 4.5 billion years ago.